Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C, and we're going to do some more A&P today. Specifically, we're going to look at some basic muscle mechanics and principles of muscle contractions. So, let's do it. To introduce this discussion on the principle of muscle mechanics, let's think real quickly if maybe you had a robotic hand like this and you were trying to program it so that whoever was going to use this could grasp a glass like this, you know, strongly enough to where you could not spill it on yourself or drop it, uh, but not so strong enough that you would shatter the glass from grasping it too tightly, right? So there's a there's a gradient there between too loose and too strong of a grip when we're talking about muscles. Or another way to think about it, you know, what if you tried to lift that to your face and you didn't have control of your muscles and it would throw it all over your face similar to the way this guy is getting drenched with some milk. Imagine that. How do you control, say, the strength of your muscles, if you want to call it that now? Uh, go try to pick up something very heavy in your room right now, and as you pull on that object, you can feel your muscles kind of slowly getting stronger and stronger and stronger, it feels like, right? That's what I want to explain here and put some terminology to these ideas. So a quick, quick reminder here, we don't want to do a physics class or anything, but here are some levers. If you are from the U.S., uh, in England, I believe you call them levers, but I usually say levers because that's the way I was taught. You can check out the first, second, third class of levers if you wish. Uh, the point is, when we're talking about muscle contraction, whether you're talking about a single fiber, and again, remember a fiber is just another word for a individual muscle cell, or you're talking about an entire bundle of fascicles, like an entire muscle contracting, whether it's you know small or large, you're going to apply these same principles uh, as we look at the muscles. So input is going to be the force that the muscle is generating, the force of muscle contraction. And it is trying to move some kind of a load, which is going to be our output uh, in this picture. There it's the dirt. Here it's the uh, dumbbell, if you want to call it that. So an output is the force exerted on some sort of load. Now a fulcrum is a pivot point, essentially, around which all the other forces will rotate through space. All right, here's an example of a third class lever, and it of course is your arm and forearm and what we call the elbow joint. Now, we want to specify something. A contraction, when you see the word contraction, it does mean that the muscle will produce some sort of tension against some sort of load. In this case, the load is just simply the bones and the musculature in the forearm and hand. Um, but, a contraction does not always shorten a muscle. Usually when you first learn about muscle contraction, it's, also, it's always about getting shorter, getting shorter. So we need to keep this straight. A tension will be produced, but a shortening, or you could say a lengthening, uh, does not always have to happen. Okay, as far as classes or types of contractions, you often hear about isotonic versus isometric. In an isotonic contraction, very simply, the load will move, and in an isometric contraction, the load will not move. So here are the nitty-gritty details. In an eccentric isotonic contraction, I'll circle it right there, right, eccentric, and it's this one here, I'm drawing an E above the arrow. You're going to see a muscle lengthen, actually, not shorten. And in this case, it looks like the load is going to win, right? It's pulling, stretching, basically making the muscle long. Okay, the opposite, and I'll put a C above this arrow right here, is a concentric isotonic contraction. And in this case, we will see the muscle get shorter. That means that whatever power you're putting into that muscle contraction is exceeding the resistance of the load, right? And so the muscle will shorten and the load will move. So we're seeing the load move in two different ways with isotonic contractions. In isometric contraction, tension will be there. Remember, tension always happens when we do a contraction, but we don't have to move the load, so to speak. So in this case, there will be no shortening or lengthening 
in an isometric type of contraction. Again, go and try to pull a tree down, right? Grab a tree and pull it. You can feel your muscles tensing, right? You can feel some tension in your muscles as you try to pull that tree. But of course, the tree is not going to move. The load is far too heavy. And so your muscle will not actually get shorter or longer. Uh, it will pretty much stay the same length, but it will still exhibit a tension. Okay, so the force, again, that's how strong that a particular muscle contraction is. And a duration is, of course, how long it is. So how strong and how long the contractions are will vary. And that, of course, is going to be in response to some sort of stimulus or hopefully stimuli, multiple stimulus successes, right? And these can be of different frequencies, right? Different, you know, stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. Uh, and intensity is a very strong versus a, a weak one. So we can measure this in a lab, and I've kind of put a very simple graph of a twitch occurring in the background here. So if we remember some of the previous talks, we talked about a latent period in which we do all of our EC coupling, right? We're going to do that, excite the motor neuron, jump the gap, and excite the muscle that's waiting on the other side of that neuromuscular junction. Well, after that, we actually get the contraction happening, right? So here's the big contraction phase. And of course, if we are going to shorten, for example, we do want to recover from that and have a relaxation period. There is a single, that's what it says right here, a single brief stimulus. It's got to be above threshold. Remember, if we don't hit threshold, uh, the muscle doesn't respond in any way because of the all or none phenomenon. So a single brief stimulus that is above threshold can be recorded on a myogram uh, like this as a twitch. I talked about this concept of a motor unit when we went over the neuromuscular junction details and we saw it as this top one here if you saw that talk with me. Uh, we saw a single motor neuron that you know we stimulated it at some sort of point. We made some action potentials that propagated down there and went to the knob and shot out the acetylcholine, right? Remember all this back from the days? But that's all we showed. We just showed a single motor neuron kind of hooking up to one single muscle fiber at one single neuromuscular junction. And that's fine. But usually, you know, in reality, you see something a little more complicated, right? So a motor neuron, which of course is the yellow fiber and all of the fibers it supplies, this is called a motor unit. For example, here's motor unit X, right? And I see one motor neuron, again, sending a signal away from the nervous system. And it looks like it's plugged into all the reddish type of fibers here. That one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. Those are all supplied, if you follow those yellow extensions from that motor neuron, they are supplying those fibers. That's one motor unit. That's a single motor unit called motor unit X. What if we wanted some more power though, right? What if the small motor unit wasn't enough, right? What if we needed to recruit some more guys to fight in our battle? Well, we could hire a new motor unit, right? There's motor unit Y. Notice where it's connected to. It's connected to that and that and this and this and this and so on and so on. All these yellowish looking fibers are all connected by motor neuron Y. And so let's imagine if we put them together, if we fired both motor neuron X and motor neuron Y, we'd get all those motor units, both of those motor units to fire simultaneously, and they would contract all of those fibers at once and give us a lot of strength. So when you think about how we decide to squeeze hard or squeeze soft, right? Small motor units will be recruited first, and then larger motor units will come online if we need to. And some of these larger motor units could control several hundred different fibers just from one single motor neuron. Okay, this concept I'm talking about of, you know, how does the, the muscles in the hand, how do they know exactly how hard to squeeze, right? And mentioned at the beginning, but we didn't give it this term, it's called coding intensity, right? How hard should I squeeze? And how should we start? Well, again, if we're trying to grasp the glass like that, we probably wouldn't want to start at full strength and then back off because at full strength, we might break the glass and then our experiment's over, right? We would probably want to start squeezing lightly and then more and more and more if necessary. So how do we code the intensity of some sort of contraction for us? So let's look at the step by step for a minute till it starts to make a little bit more sense. So let's first look here at this one right here, okay? One is a stimulus. I'm hitting some sort of motor system 
uh, with a stimulus, right? And did I cause a depolarization? Looks like it, you know, looks like I kind of tickled it, is what we called it in several talks ago. Uh, a weak or local depolarization has occurred, but notice I didn't hit threshold. And this dotted line right here is supposed to represent threshold. I'll just put thresh as well as I can right there. We didn't hit threshold. And because of the all or none phenomenon we talked about, we generate zero action potentials there. So we did stimulate it, but not enough to hit threshold. So down here, we got zero motor units fired in that particular structure. And if we have no motor units firing, we get no tension down here whatsoever. No contraction occurred. We didn't hit threshold. Same thing with number two. I'm hitting it with a little bit more stimulus, maybe a couple of, you know, weak stimuli have summated to add up to a stronger stimulus, but still we haven't hit threshold. So it's a sub-threshold stimulus. The other non phenomenon tells us we are not going to stimulate any contraction whatsoever. No fibers will fire and we should get no tension whatsoever. Well, if you look at three here, once we get up to threshold, now we can start to get some action from inside of the muscle tissue. So we did hit threshold. We should generate action potentials for the first time now, and we should get some. Again, the small motor units will fire. We don't want to fire all of them if we barely hit threshold. That would be overkill. So we start by firing the smaller motor units first. And you can see we've got a little twitch now that's observable uh, on a myogram, let's say. So we did get some tension, we did get some twitch because we did get to threshold stimulus. And that's what it says right here. A muscle will contract more vigorously as we increase the stimulus above threshold. So four and five and six and seven. Notice as we increase the stimulus over threshold, we get more and more and more and more motor units to fire inside that particular structure. So we should get more and more and more and more tension. Now, of course, you're not Superman, right? You can't just have limitless return here. At some point, you will fire, as you see right here, all of the motor units will be fired. And you can hit it with even stronger and stronger and stronger stimuli, like right up here, but you've already hit the maximum amount of fibers that will fire, so you are at maximum tension right there. So just to be clear here, contraction force is controlled by recruitment. That is the idea here. We're going to recruit the small motor units first and get a little bit of tension. And if we need more and more and more tension, we're going to recruit larger and larger motor units. Once we hit some maximum tension, that implies that we've recruited all the motor units and that's about as much force as we can give in that particular action. Okay, speaking of recruitment, uh, we usually hear about three types of fibers that are recruited. Again, smalls come first, and then some larger ones, and then the bigger ones. So the first type, these first motor units that are fired, are usually called SO, or slow oxidative fibers. They contract aerobically, right? That means they're going to be using oxygen that's available. They're going to be using things like Krebs cycle, electron transport, which we'll talk about in other talks, to produce ATP very, very rapidly. Now, they will produce low power contractions, but they will last longer, right? So lower power contractions, again, these are the small motor units, but they will last over longer periods of times, and they're slow to fatigue. Sometimes these are referred to as type 1 fibers or slow twitch. Sometimes they're called red fibers. If you need more tension, you would recruit more motor units. Specifically, you would go to the second layer of motor unit called the FO fibers, or the fast oxidative fibers. Now, they primarily are aerobic, but they do have the ability to switch over to the anaerobic pathways. So they will fatigue more quickly than we saw from the type 1s. Now, these are called type 2s, but they're often referred to as type 2A fibers. And they are fast twitch. Sometimes they're referred to as white fibers. The third type here, the big boys here, the thirds, these are fast glycolytic fibers. So they have not much oxygen and not many mitochondria. So they're primarily relying on glycolysis and they're doing this very, very quickly. So they're recycling ATP very, very quickly and they can contract quickly, not only contract, but also relax very quickly as well. So some of these have very large diameters. Again, you're going to 
recruit these large motor units last, and they should be able to give us a very large long-lasting contractile force. This is a type 2B, not a type 3 fiber, and these are your really ultra-fast twitch white fibers. Trepe, sometimes pronounced trep, or die Treppe, the German phrase that it come from, meaning the steps. So over here, we see a twitch, just a normal twitch, uh, stimulus, you know, we get an observable contraction. Goes back to rest. Observable contraction with, you know, another stimulus, then another stimulus, and another stimulus, right? The point is, what if, and skeletal muscles can do this, heart muscles can do this, what if we hit this tissue with very quick and very intense stimuli? Now we're going to let it rest, that's the important part, but what happens if we do this? We're going to see this step pattern occur, right? We got a contraction, then we went to rest, then we got a stronger contraction, right? More tension, then we got a rest, and we got more tension, then back to rest, then more tension, like we're walking up a staircase or up the steps. This is trep. So what it says here is the next series of contractions is stronger than the previous one. Now again, at some point you'll get to a maximum, but we don't see it in this image. That This is called trep, or the steps. Keep in mind here that we are resting between each stimulus, though. Even though they are getting stronger and stronger, we are resting in between each one. And this leads us into the concept of tetany or tetanus. Notice in this, it looks like we're getting stronger and stronger and stronger contractions, like we're going step here, or trep, but notice we're not going back to rest. So we're getting stimuli that are so rapid that we're not allowing the tissue to rest. This is called tetanus. And as we're doing this upward motion where we see these kind of waves summating, basically, this can be called wave summation or it can be called incomplete tetanus. It's on the way to tetany if it doesn't stop. If you don't stop giving it such rapid stimulus, it will go into complete tetanus, right? So over here on the right, we see complete tetanus where the muscle is essentially locked up. And if you can think of the condition known as tetanus in humans, it causes what we call lock jaw, right? It causes the muscles to lock up in place or to become tetanic. So complete tetanus is where we have the muscle basically cramped up where it won't uncramp. And that will, of course, at some point lead to complete fatigue of the muscle. Think about somebody getting shot with a taser and how their muscles kind of lock up temporarily and they fall to the ground because they can't control their muscles any longer. This is an example of complete tetanus. Okay, we have to talk about energy loss for just a minute. I've kind of put a picture from a desert here where you see the heat waves coming up off the pavement. That's what that's supposed to represent. The thing is this, when you're doing muscle work, only about 40% of the energy that's generated and released, you know, during the activity of a muscle workout or whatever is used as work. Only 40%, less than half. The remaining 60% is given off as heat from the body. And of course, you know this, but the, the number is quite startling. So it's a constant reminder of how just inefficient a human body really is and why we have to keep eating and eating and eating all the time to give us power to do these very, very inefficient musculature activities. Now, muscle tone, uh, sometimes it's referred to as muscle tonus, is simply just a partial sustained contraction. It's that easy. Um, you want your muscles to be ready to fire at a moment's notice. So they achieve this level of tonus so you can get out of there. You know, let's see a lion and you got to run real quick to get away with it. You don't want to warm up, right? You don't have to say, hold on, predator. Let me jog in place a minute and get my muscles warmed up so I can get the heck out of here. You want to run now, right? So this is the purpose of a tone in your muscle. Now, for those of you trying to bodybuild or get bigger and bigger musculature, you may have heard of this already. It's called the overload principle. You must, if you want a muscle to get larger, like in space, you must force it to work hard. And if you don't force it to work hard, meaning you fake it, you're not going to see that muscle growth. So if you intend to do some kind of workout, you got to do it for real, or you're really just kind of dancing instead of working out, right? So muscles will adapt to increase demands, but the demands have to be upped and upped and upped. And that's what I mean by overload, right? 
hypertrophy, hyper meaning more than, tro referring to growth, right? Now, your, your muscles don't actually add new cells, even though that is very debatable, I know. Uh, they get larger, right? They get bigger in size. And to the opposite effect, if you had some sort of atrophy, right? This would be where they get smaller in size, right? Not in numbers, but in size. So if you want to work out where your muscles get larger, you have to, if you want them to hypertrophy, you have to overload them. And this is called the overload principle if you want to see further gains. And at some point it becomes very, very difficult to get those last little parts of the musculature that you want. That's why they're in there in the gym working out a lot to get that. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that little talk on some principles of muscle mechanics. Thanks for watching it, of course. Check out some other videos if you want to learn more about A&P. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.